the powerful things happening when we worship together. Isn't that good? So we are the choir this morning, and it was beautiful. Just turn to someone this morning, and you say to them, you sing like an angel. Yeah. If you don't think the person next to you sings very well, then you're not lying. You're just speaking prophetically that good things are coming from them this morning, all right? That's awesome. An angelic choir. Love it. <laughs> well, who's excited to be together this morning? Isn't it good? Great. And even if you haven't got someone who can sing in tune sitting next to you, it's good to be together. And we have a positive influence on, on one another. I don't know about you, but there's just this continuation of what God is doing at the moment and calling us to and moving the church on. And so when God starts something, he doesn't just finish it off mid-sentence, but he follows through and does everything that he intends to do in our lives. Amen? The word says that what God has started in us, he will bring it to completion. You're a job in progress. You're a work in progress. Some of us more than others. Some of us uh, feel like we're only just getting there. Amen. But God's going to do the job. Isn't that great? We don't have to do it. God's going to finish this, the work he started in each of us. So that's really exciting. We are super excited about this month of June. Uh, as you have seen, we're calling it the M4 Legacy. How many people might know what the M4 stands for? Anybody that's not a motorway? It's uh, <laughs> Anybody can tell me, apart from Mark or anybody on staff, maybe you should ask our staff. Maybe they, Anybody can put their hand up. We've got a chocolate fish, have we? Have we got a chocolate fish? No, we haven't. <laughs> we'll get a chocolate fish for you. If someone can stand up and tell me what the M4, the four M's in our vision document stand for. There's a hint. Okay, the, the number one goal of this month is everyone will know what M4 stands for by the end of June, all right? It stands for, what's the first word? It stands for mission. It stands for mercy. It stands for ministry. And it stands for momentum. Actually, can I borrow that, that form? Can I just borrow that? Here it is. It's, someone was cheating down there. There's, yeah, you... You have to stand up and, and be bold to get the fish, all right? You can't just... In this document, if you haven't got one of these, even if you're visiting this morning, you're welcome to take one. It's our vision document of Engaged Church. This is only our third Sunday is Engaged Church. How exciting is that? And it's built around our vision and our, and our vision to reach our community and see God do fantastic things. The M4 is all written out in there. And you have it on your coffee table at home, do you not? And you open it and you read it every morning in your devotions and you get ready for, for the day. You probably don't. But just anyway, make yourself aware of what it is because our theme this month is M4 Legacy and it's a legacy built around these beliefs that we're here for mission, we're here for mercy, we're here for ministry and we're here for momentum. And so on the 27th, we're going to have a fantastic day. We've got a special day planned of special legacy giving. And a legacy, of course, is about beyond ourselves. It's a cause greater than ourselves. And we're believing for God to do something significant at this time. How many people know God is moving, doing some stuff? The wind of the Holy Spirit is blowing. And you know, it's not up to us to control the Spirit. It's up to us to move with the Spirit. Jesus said the Holy Spirit blows. He, you don't know where he's come from and you don't know where he's going. And he says it's up to us to move with the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of God. There's been a wind shift, right? <laughs> And we can't control the wind, but we can set our sails accordingly. And that's what we're doing as a church, setting our sails for what God is going to do. So make sure you grab one of those. Oh, you can grab that later on. Cool. Awesome. Well, um, just before we start this morning, because I'm going to start, lay a bit of a foundation for our M4 Legacy series, and then uh, we're going to have Amy speaking next week, Andy to Shroom, and then Mike, and then on the 27th, we're having a great uh, morning together as we take up our offering. Uh, so I'm going to lay a bit of a foundation, but actually, just before we start, um, I, my son, who lives, our son, who lives in uh, Christchurch, and you know they went through a period of flooding down there last weekend. In the middle of the flooding, he sent me this little meme. I think that's what you call it. Meme. Oh, meme. Sorry, meme. a meme. 
who says, if you need an ark, I know a guy. <laughs> Isn't that great? And I thought it was sort of appropriate because uh, we, know, we know all about flooding here, right? So, um, so next time you see someone in trouble, just say, I know a guy, all right? Why don't you say that to someone next to you? <laughs> I know a guy. Is that all right? Was that a bit silly? Was that? Yeah, that was good. How many people think that was cool? Yeah. yeah. All right. Yeah. Vote. The vote is positive. It's, we've got it. So this morning, I want to speak uh, on the legacy of faith. And, uh, you know, God is calling us into a dimension of faith. Faith is everything to do with what we do not have. It's everything to do with what we cannot see. If you already have something, if you can already see something, then faith is irrelevant. Faith is what invades the realm of the invisible. And that's my first point this morning, that faith works in the invisible. And uh, I probably could use another word there, the faith thrives in the area of the invisible. So if you can't see it, but you need it, then faith will take you to that place. Faith will take us places and help us achieve and receive things that right now we do not have. And I think this is the exciting part about legacy because faith, we're going to need faith to go where God's calling us, right? We're going to need another level of faith to go, go into those places. And I think the danger for us as individuals or even as a church that we can get to a place where we are no longer believing for something that's greater than ourselves, that we no longer believe for something that we do not yet have. And my question this morning is to us, what is in your life that you are believing for that you do not yet have? What is it that you're striving for, believe or not striving, that's not a good word, in faith for, that God has not yet given you? Are there any things in your life? Because if we get to a place where we are no longer believing in faith, we're no longer in faith, in other words, there is no longer anything in my life that I'm believing for and that's stretching my faith and testing my faith, then we're in a comfortable place. And we don't want to be comfortable, right? You know, comfortable Christianity is no longer Christianity. Those two words just can't coexist together. Comfortable and Christianity cannot coexist together in the same sentence. So God is wanting to stretch our faith and bring us into a place where we invade the invisible and the impossible. And then uh, in, I've got a couple of verses here, but in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 3, it says, It is by faith that we understand that the universe was created by God's word, so that what can be seen was made out of what cannot be seen. Everything that God creates and brings into being came from a place we cannot see. Isn't this amazing? It's so challenging that, that, that what we have came from somewhere that didn't exist. God is just the master of nothing. He can take the invisible and he can bring it into being. And 2 Corinthians verse, chapter 4 and verse 18 says, So we do not look at the things which are seen, but at the things which are unseen. For the things which are visible are temporary, but the things which are invisible are eternal. And this is what faith does. It focuses, it sets our eyes on the things that we can't see. Quite interesting, isn't it? Because we get so used to focusing on what we do have. And God's saying, there's more to go, there's more to come, and there's more to have. But at the moment, you can't see it, and you don't have it. And God is calling us. So when it comes to, to things like giving and mission and believing God for, for the next stage, you know, we can't see it right now. We can't see it physically but we can see it with the eyes of faith. Paul said that we do not walk by sight, but we walk by faith. We live by faith, not by sight. Interesting that he was, in the context of that verse, he was actually talking about heaven, and he was talking about the day that we're going to go be with the Lord and get new bodies. He was saying, the body I've got ain't doing too well. I'm looking forward to getting a new body. Anybody in that category this morning? We're going to have wonderful, glorious bodies. And he was saying that we live by faith. In other words, we can't see that yet. We can't see heaven yet. And, and, you know, if you're a believer this morning, you're believing in Jesus Christ, can I get you to raise your hand if you've physically seen heaven? Anybody physically seen heaven? No? Has anybody actually physically seen Jesus? No? No one here. 
So that's faith. So how many people can ask, that, put it this way, how many people believe in heaven? How many people believe in Jesus? But we've actually never seen him and we've never seen heaven. That is faith. So we can take the faith that we have through salvation and bring it into our walk. This is what Paul was saying. We don't just have it up there, but it's here and now. I live by faith and I walk by faith. You know, there was a, um, one of the disciples who was Thomas. After Jesus had been crucified, buried, and, and was risen again, he appeared to the disciples in a room, in a locked room. He came through the door. And he presented himself to the disciples. And one of the disciples, Thomas, wasn't there at the time. And when the other disciples told Thomas, he said, well, unless I can see him, I'll never believe. And then the second time Jesus came into that room, Thomas was there. And Jesus went up to Thomas and said, put your, your fingers in my, the holes in my hands and put your hand in my side. And then Thomas broke down and said, oh, Lord, my God. And Jesus said to him this, he said, you believe because you have seen, but how even more blessed are those who are going to believe but have never seen. Do you know, that's us. That's us today. We walk and we live in a dimension of faith. We haven't seen Jesus physically, but we know he's here. Amen. Jesus is present in this room by faith. The Holy Spirit is with us this morning by faith. We don't see it. But there's a greater faith to believe in what you cannot see because it takes us into the area of the invisible. I don't know whether you've ever thought of this, but in uh, 1 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 17, um, this is Paul talking to Timothy, and he says, Now to the king eternal, and this often is used as a, um, a doxology or a, a finishing statement in the service, isn't it? Now to the king eternal, immortal, invisible, to God who alone is wise, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. And I'd never seen this, but when I read that passage, it says, to the king eternal, to the king immortal, and then it says invisible. And I suddenly clicked that the invisibility of God is actually part of the nature of God. God did not suddenly decide to make himself invisible to be tricky, right? He just didn't say, I'm going to make life difficult for these people so you can't see me. I'm going to hide and I'm invisible. The invisibility of God is actually part of his character and part of his nature. Because if, if we could see God, there'd be no dimension of faith, would there? And God is calling us into this realm of the invisible and the impossible because what lies in the invisible area is everything that we need. What lies in the invisible is our miracle, is our healing, is our salvation, and is revival in this nation. It exists right now, but it's in the invisible. And God is calling us as a church, as people of faith, to go to the invisible. This is exciting, isn't it? Because everything we need is there. But without faith, God's not going to release it to us. God is calling us to this new dimension of faith. As you'll just um, mention that during the week, we had a, a couple come to speak to us um, at the staff meeting, actually. They were traveling through a, a, a lovely older couple who, who are American couple. And uh, they've been coming to New Zealand, I think, since about the year 2000. So um, have a real heart and passion for this country. But they've traveled the world as well. He's an evangelist, and they go and preach, and they've been seeing incredible moods of God and works of the Holy Spirit and just great things. But he was saying something interesting that really caught my attention, and that was they've traveled the world, but they said New Zealand is the only place where churches and leaders and people are calling out a revival to the nation. Most other countries are calling out revivals in their areas and their cities and their places, but he said New Zealand is unique. Everywhere you go, you hear people speaking revival into our nation. Isn't that exciting? And we, we have something special. I believe God doesn't just want to do little bits of revivals here and there, and people are running in different directions to try and get blessed, but there's a revival coming to our nation. There is God is asking us to step in faith and to stay in faith for him to do something powerful in this nation. But you know what? If we're going to speak revival to the nation, where do you think God is going to start? <laughs> He's going to start here, isn't he? He's going to start here. And God is going to birth something in our hearts. We cannot expect and ask God to do something that we cannot see yet without God doing it in us first. This is incredible, the work of God that he's stirring in us at the moment. So number one we need to grab hold of is that faith thrives. 
faith prospers in the area of the invisible. So this is my question. What have you got in your life that you don't have yet that you're believing for? Make sure there's plenty on that list (laughs) because that's where faith takes you. That's where faith grows and it strengthens in the area of the invisible. But the second thing where faith works is faith works. um, We're going to bring up the in obedience. So um, in Hebrews chapter 11, back to chapter 11 and verse 8 of Hebrews, it says this. I'll read it off my notes. By faith, Abraham obeyed God. And if we want to really look at the, uh, the DNA of faith, I guess, the, the genetic code of faith, then we go back to Abraham and Sarah, who are known as the father and the mother of our faith today. And we, if we're believers in Jesus Christ, the word says that we actually are children of Abraham. That's incredible, isn't it? Now we go back so far, about 5,000 years plus, to a gentleman called Abraham and his wife Sarah, and we are called children of Abraham. And this... Uh, verse in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 8 says, By faith Abraham obeyed God. He went out not knowing where he was going. If we're going to walk, walk in faith and, and see th- incredible things happen, God is going to put a demand on us to be obedient to his word. And the interesting thing was that the faith or the, the faith of, of Abraham and Sarah was tested through obedience. In fact, the, the word says about Jesus that he learnt obedience through suffering. It's an incredibly powerful thing, obedience. And if we're going to see things happen, we have to learn to be obedient to what God says in, in incredible ways. And it might, not, it might not be huge things, you know. Abraham was huge. He was called to go somewhere he didn't know. He was called to even potentially sacrifice his own son. God tested him through obedience. But that obedience was what released blessing to so many other people. And this is the legacy part of faith. Because obedience doesn't just bless us, it blesses others around us. And in Genesis chapter 12, this is the promise that God gave to Abraham. I will make you into a great nation, and I will bless you, and I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and curse those who curse you, and all the peoples on earth will be blessed through you. Isn't that an incredible promise? That one person's obedience could change this whole world. And the same with Jesus. His obedience to the cross actually changed the world that we live in. And here's the reality and the power of obedience, that it's someone else's blessing and it's someone else's miracle and it's someone else's healing, someone else's salvation, whatever that, that, that is needed. It's someone else's touch of God lies on the other side of our obedience. And when we're obedient, things change and things happen on a larger scale. And it can be the smallest little thing that we called to, to be obedient in. I remember, it's going back a couple of years, a few years, I remember sitting on a plane uh, and next to a, a young guy, and we were traveling, going somewhere where I think it was out of Christchurch, and we were on a, on a jet on a 737. And as we sat on the runway about to take off, we were looking out the window to the wing and there was this bang and pop and this whole pile of black smoke came out of the engine that we were looking at, which wasn't a good sign. And we sat there nervously for a few moments and the captain came on the intercom and he said, we've got a problem with our engine. Wow, you know. And he said, no panic, don't, we're all good. The guys are coming out to fix this engine. So we were sitting there looking out the window, watching the guys come out and get up on their cherry pickers and working on this engine. And being a bit young and bold, I said to this young fella, um, yeah, it was really good that the engine broke down now, not just after we'd taken off, you know. <laughs> and I could see the beads of sweat, but like what I've got on, my, on his forehead. And they were starting to come down the sides of his face. So I thought, why not? Let's just pursue this. <laughs> <laughs> I was on the aisle seat. He was on the window seat. We were locked in the plane. He wasn't going anywhere. So I said, the main thing is, even if we do crash, it's knowing where we go when we die. (laughs) And the perspiration was now pouring off his forehead. And, you know, it was this little niggle of the Holy Spirit within me, all right? Like, I'm not normally like that as a person, okay? I'm not normally confrontational and rude. Not all the time, anyway. And this poor young guy, and he looked at me and he said, you're a Christian, aren't you? And I said, I know a guy. <laughs> I didn't say that. 
<laughs> so we got talking. So that led to a conversation, as you, as you would think. It was either going to shut down the conversation or it was going to open it up one, one way or other. And so we got talking, and, and I asked him what his story was. And this guy had left England about six months earlier, and he had people who were praying for him. And he had an auntie who was a nun, a 70-year-old nun back in England. And when this young guy decided to leave, she said to him, you know you're running away from what God wants to do in your life, don't you? And he said, that's exactly right. He said, I'm on the run. And she said to him, I'm going to pray that every plane you get on, every train you get on, every boat, every place you stay, every hotel, backpackers, wherever you go, there will be Christians who will confront you with the message of Jesus Christ. Isn't that wonderful? So I said, man, I've got to go for the kill now. So <laughs> I said, shall we pray? Shall we, let's, let's just get this done. Let's just move on. Let's give your life to Jesus right now. He said, no. <laughs> so I backed off a little bit. But what, and, and then we, we had a fantastic conversation. We got where we were going. The plane didn't crash, obviously. And, and he went on his way. He didn't respond right there and then. But what it made me realize is that I had that little niggle of the Holy Spirit inside me. Imagine if I hadn't said, I know, I know there would be other people on the way, but there's somebody praying for that young man to have a confrontation or, or a, an intervention in his life with people. And sometimes when God speaks to us, it's not about my blessing. It's not about what God wants to do in my life. It's about the people who are around me. And this is the community that we live in. God is wanting to touch us. So whatever that moment of obedience is, to go next door and speak to your neighbor, to pick up the phone, to make that gift, to, to bless somebody somehow, whatever that moment of obedience is, it's someone else's blessing on the other side. And that's the legacy of faith. It is in our obedience, and it's going to be in our giving as well. You see, our giving, and I'll speak to this because this is what our month is about. Can I just encourage you, just because it's going to be a month about giving, don't not come to church, all right? So this is a really good month not to come to church because I don't want to deal with this stuff. But you know, I want to say that when God, it's, yes, it's about money. Yes, it's about giving. We're going to get to that point by the end of the month. But it's so much more than that because God, it's actually about our hearts. God wants, you know, God, God doesn't weigh our gift. He weighs our heart, Right? And God's more interested in the largeness of our heart than the largest of our gift. And God is going to work in our heart. So I encourage this today and this month, stick with it. Come with us on a journey because God is about to change us even more. And it's more than our giving. It's more than our gift. It's this community. It's the mission to bring the gospel of Jesus Christ to people to, who need to hear that they're loved, that they're cared for, that there's hope that there's an eternity that we can have through Jesus. That's our mission, amen? amen? And so our giving is around that. That's why we called it the M4 Legacy, because it's greater than we are. It's greater than what we can do right now. And I, and I want to add, because I know Mike said this, but I want to say this. I have a deep conviction in my heart. When we talk about legacy, we're not just talking about uh, the children in this church and the, gener and the young people in this church. We're talking about people who are yet to even hear the gospel for the first time. That's our legacy. It's another generation of people who have not even heard the name of Jesus in context of the gospel of Jesus Christ. There will be thousands. I believe this all with my heart. There are going to be thousands of people in this community, in this city, who are going to come to know Jesus Christ as a result of the legacy and the foundation that we lay, even in this month. So we need to be, be part of that. Amen? Amen? Let's be involved and let's God change our hearts on the way through. And let's be obedient to what he is doing. Tithing. Can I just throw this in? We're talking about money this morning. Is this all right? Let's have a vote. It's all right to talk about tithing. Because tithing is actually the level of our obedience. And, and, and I know, I, I don't want to get into a big debate about whether tithing is, is biblical or not, because it actually, you know, some people will say it's under law. Well, it was in the law, but it was also before the law. Do you know the first person to tithe? Strangely enough, it was Abraham. He, and Melchizedek, the, the high priest, met him after battle, and in worship, Abraham bowed down and gave him a tenth of everything he had. That was the first time tithing and giving to, to that level, the 10%, was actually mentioned. Yes, it's in the law. It's in Malachi. Jesus talked about it. 
If you're going to say Jesus um, didn't want people to tithe, you'd have to throw out prayer, you'd have to throw out fasting, you'd have to throw out doing good because Jesus talked about it in that context and said you shouldn't ignore the weightier matters of the law without neglecting the other ones, talking about tithing and prayer and fasting. And then Paul goes on to say, well, tithing is actually just the baseline. Generosity is the top line. <laughs> it's not just about tithing. That's just where we start. So this offering that we're doing is over and above our tithes. We tithe into the house of God for the ministry and the work, but we give to the growth and the momentum of what God wants to do in this place. Is that good this morning? We need to get tithing. It's a moment of obedience. <laughs> And, and, you know, sometimes, and I used to say this, I used to say this to myself, when I get more money, I'll be able to tithe. Has anybody used that as an excuse? <laughs> I did. But, you know, if we can't give out of the little we have, we'll never give out of the abundance that we've got. <laughs> We'll never give fully because God teaches us the principle at this level in the area of tithing. And this really goes on to this third point that I want to mention, where, where faith really thrives, and it's in the area of generosity. So when you look at the life of Abraham and Sarah, they, weren't, they were people of faith. They saw into the invisible. They were obedient to respond when God tested them. But greater than that, they were generous so generosity comes to the people who are already generous. In Luke chapter 6 and verse 38, it says this. You may have heard this said differently in different versions. This is out of the, the Passion Translation. But it says, give generously and generous gifts will be given back to you. Shaken down to make more room or to room for more. Abundant gifts will pour out upon you with such an overflowing measure that it will run over the top. The measurement of your generosity becomes the measurement of your return. Isn't that great? So God is not just calling us to tithing. That's just the start. God is calling us into a life of generosity. And, and the reality is what generosity speaks to is it tells me when I'm generous, I'm making a declaration that I know where everything comes from in the first place anyway. It's a declaration that all I have is from God. It's, it's the, the, the more I fear, the, hold, the, the tighter I hold on to things. If I fear for my future, if I fear that I won't have enough, I hold on tight to what I've already got. And generosity is not measured by what I hold on to. It's, it's measured, sorry, by what I let go. And so God wants to bring us to this place where I just generously and abundantly give because we can never outgive God. Amen? And that's, that's the truth in, in our life. And there's... We can, we can look at Locke's examples. I was just thinking about the example of Zacchaeus, actually. We don't have the verse for that, but I'll just mention it. That when Zacchaeus got, came to know the Lord, actually Jesus pulled him out of a tree. You might remember that story. He was only a short fellow. He got in a tree to see Jesus over the crowds. Jesus looked up and said, Zacchaeus, come down. I'm coming to your place for lunch. And Jesus turned up and showed him mercy, showed him grace. And then in the middle of all that, Zacchaeus cries out and he says, he says, everything that I have stolen from other people because tax collectors were basically renowned thieves, all right? They just used their position of power to steal from the people. And Zacchaeus said two things. He said, half of what I, everything I have, I'm going to sell and give to the poor. And if I've taken anything from anybody, I'm going to give it back four times the amount. So he moved from a place of greed and a place of fear into a place of generosity. Do you know what Jesus said to him? He said, today salvation has come to this house because you, Zacchaeus, are a son of Abraham. Isn't that amazing? That, that quality of generosity marked him out as a son of Abraham. It's the same quality today that marks us out as sons and daughters of Abraham, of children of faith. And I, I love this other story um, that, that many of us know and I, I believe is so powerful. But it's in this area um, of giving. And there was one day when Jesus was in the temple and he was, the Bible says he was observing the people who were giving, which is really interesting to me because sometimes we think, think Jesus or God's that interested in what I give. But he was in the temple watching the people bring their tithes and their the offerings and their gifts into the temple. 
And all the, the religious people were coming in and they were dancing and what they used to do was blow the trumpet. So when Brother Bob came in with his gift, they'd blow the trumpet and everybody would watch to see how much he put in the plate. That would be an interesting process, wouldn't it? And Jesus was just observing this whole religious nonsense that was going on. And then after all the fanfare, this widow came into the temple. And she came in and she put in what was called two mites. Now, mite, a mite is so small, we don't even have a currency uh, to represent that. Today. It's probably half a cent. And she came in and she put a cent or two cents in the offering. When Jesus saw this, he said to his disciples, he observed this widow giving. And he said, the widow has given more than everybody else who's come into the temple to give because they gave from their abundance but this woman has given everything that she has. And see, this is, this is what God does. He measures our heart, not our gift. He weighs our heart. Proverbs tells us that God weighs our heart. And, and he's interested in the largeness of our heart, not the largeness of our gift. And this is the challenge we've got coming this month. I hope we're up for it. I hope we're excited about this stage because it's, a, I believe, a, a pivotal moment, a historic moment for us as a church, that we're going to lay a foundation that's going to go way beyond our time here, that God's going to grow something very, very special. Maybe the Mizos can come and join us on stage. And so this morning, I want us to take a moment just to look into our hearts and to ask God how he wants to move, what he wants to do with us, because there's going to come on the 27th, yes, it's going to be time for a gift, and we've got a handout we're going to give out next week. We'll give more detail about that. But I don't want the focus to be on the gift. I want the focus to be on what God is doing in our hearts. Amen? And I believe we're in a moment where, where God wants to release not just finance, but God wants to release healing, and he wants to release. This is the power of faith. It's not just about the gift. It's about the giver. We receive from, from him, from God, gifts that we can bless others with, but it's about him and it's about what he wants to do in our lives. So I have a strong conviction this morning that if we're just willing to, to open our hearts to what God wants to do, if we, we're just willing to say, God, what do you want to do in my heart? Yes, it might be about giving, but I just want us to put giving aside this morning and just say, God, what is it you want to change in my heart? What is it you want to do? Because the river flows through us that can't help but change us. It's not what God does around us, it's what God does in us, amen? And so we're going to ask the Holy Spirit to work in us this morning and touch our hearts. So can we stand? I want to just have this moment to allow the Holy Spirit to reach into us. You know, maybe there's things that, that God's put on your heart that you need to be obedient to. Maybe it's to talk to someone. Maybe you've felt that stirring your heart to do something, to go to somebody, to speak out, whatever that is. That God will give us the courage to, to be obedient. If it's to see in the, into the invisible. You know, one of the things that we do with faith is that, is that when, when we haven't seen the answers that we have wanted to see, I don't know if anybody's prayed and you haven't seen the answers to those prayers yet. It's me, I haven't seen answers to prayers that I'm praying. The danger of what we do is then we lower our expectations to meet our experience. But God is just saying, just take away the expectations, just lift those expectations. Because sometimes when we're hurt or we're disappointed, our expectations control our faith. And God is just saying, don't, don't let that control you. Don't let fear control you. You know, if we've been hurt in a relationship, it's hard sometimes to open again. If we've prayed and something hasn't happened, we've prayed for healing. Sometimes we pray for people to be healed and they aren't healed. Sometimes they even die. And it's really, really hard work to deal with our broken expectations and our disappointments sometimes. But can I say this morning, let's just open up to God and say, God, I don't want to be ruled by, by my brokenness. I want to be healed and that I can be set free so that everything that you have for me will flow into my life so I can be a blessing to others.